Joining us now from Mexico City is Oscar Chacon. He's the co-founder and executive director of Alianza Americas, a network of Latin American and Caribbean immigrant organizations in the United States. Here with us in the studio is Rafael Bernal. He's a staff writer with The Hill, a political newspaper here in Washington, D.C. From Philadelphia, Alan McPherson is a professor of history at Temple University, and Mark Fierstein is a senior advisor with the Albright Stonebridge Group's Latin America practice. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Let's start in Mexico City with Oscar. And Oscar, we've got 5,000 people moving through Central America. Some of them have arrived at the border of the United States. But I want to get back to where these people are coming from. And I was wondering if you could give us some idea of what would compel families, uh, husbands, wives, children, probably granddads, grandmothers, what would compel them to pick up and move from there, make this perilous trip across Central America trying to get some kind of relief from the United States? Well, the main reason people are fleeing, I would summarize it in one word. It is desperation. And it is desperation because people have come to a dead end in as far as a reality in which they face death, the possibility of death on a daily basis. Uh, as people may know, Honduras is one of the most violent countries in the whole world. Uh, second of all, there is a systemic problem with poverty, exclusion, that makes a lot of people feel, again, trapped between a very violent place and a place that denies them a basic condition to raise a family in a way that can be called dignified. And number three, there is also a problem with government negligence. Uh, people do not feel that their governments are doing enough to be able to make them feel that they have an opportunity in their own home. And all this boils down to a situation where, again, people feel so desperate, so incredibly frustrated, that they pick anything they have, their lives very often is all they have, and then they take off, think off, I mean, to basically undertake a journey that is full of perils, full of difficulties. Anybody who's been following this particular caravan from the moment they enter Guatemala, then Mexico, it's not been an easy trip for most of them. And the only explanation to why they endured all these difficulties is because of what is behind in their own countries. And this is the part that we need to understand. This particular exodus is crying out to everyone who cares to hear that the rules that we have in order to secure humanitarian protection for populations like this are highly inadequate. And we are indeed bound to see a crisis mounting in the U.S. southern border, in this particular instance, in Tijuana, border in San Diego. Mark, the U.S. response to this has been that these are not really asylum seekers. They're economic migrants. These are people seeking jobs, seeking a place to live in the United States, seeking a better life here. Well, look, I think there's only, as we've heard, you know, white people are coming here. They're fleeing violence. They're fleeing economic deprivation. The only way to solve that problem is to improve the lives of people in Central America. Uh, during the Obama administration, which I had an opportunity to serve in, we basically tripled assistance uh, to the countries of Honduras, uh, Guatemala, and El Salvador, basically to strengthen their capacity to improve the lives of people there, to give them incentives to stay. There are plenty of things that we can do here. We can separate families. We can deny people asylum. That's not going to stop the flow of migration. We've seen this uh, over and over again. The only way to do it is to get at the root causes uh, of, of the situation there. Unfortunately, we've heard from President Trump, he's talked about uh, cutting assistance, suspending assistance. That would be counterproductive. That would just lead to more migration. Fortunately, I think that there are uh, wiser folks in the administration uh, that will prevail over President Trump. And I think we're going to see a continuation of the aid flows to these countries, which is so essential. But when you talk about, uh, Mark, when you talk about uh, assistance being given to these countries, to take away the reasons for people to leave there, as you pointed out, assistance has been tripled. But it's not worked, has it? Well. I think we, I, don't, I don't think we can expect that countries that have had, you know, challenging uh, security situations, challenging economic conditions for decades, for centuries, in, in, in some cases, that that's going to change in a year or two. Um, I think I think there is some evidence mm -hmm. that, that there have been some incremental gains. We've seen the rates of murders, for example, in the three countries decline. Uh, but I think we have to view this as a medium to long-term challenge, and not expect that you know if we provide some assistance to these countries at six months to a year that all of a sudden these countries are going to become you know, middle-class functioning democracies. That's not the way development works. Rafael, one of the biggest complaints we've heard is that much of the American assistance actually goes to American corporations. They want to protect American interests in these countries and not the people of these countries. I mean, is that a valid complaint? 
Well, it, it harkens back to the uh, United Fruit Company and, and, and the history of, of the United States and Central America. This is a complaint that's, that's not going to go away. Any impression that this is happening is always going to come to the forefront. It's, it's a balance of things. And, and, and really, a lot of the aid, the uh, 750 million that was sent there to stop this migratory crisis at some point, went more to the security apparatus and, and, and did play a role in the reduction of that 30%, almost 30% in some cases, reduction in the murder rate. So that, that part has helped. But I mean, part of the problem with these, these countries is they have very weak institutions. You don't have transparency. You have a lot of corruption. So the idea that the money is not getting to a place where, where it's going to help the situation and you, you can't discount it, and it's, it's very likely that that's happening. Yeah. One other point, Rafael, and that is uh, this has become a big uh, political issue here in the United States. I mean, it was front and center during the election campaign. President Trump couldn't stop talking about it. How does this play politically in the U.S.? Well, I, I mean, first of all, you, you have to say, when you talk about this being the, the, well, when the administration talks about this being the worst immigration crisis in the history of the country, it's far from it. Yeah. That, that we do have a, a number that we can say that is not true. In the last election, it didn't play well for President Trump. It, it, he won two seats in the Senate that were very, that, where he campaigned very aggressively on this issue. But we have to remember the Democrats in, 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 in Missouri and Indiana, they sort of campaigned very far to the right of, the, of their own party. And they, they were like Trump light on, they, they did talk about border security as a priority. If you look at the border now, there is not a single district that was won by somebody that, that supports the border wall or that supports the idea that there is a border crisis at the moment, uh, including uh, probably Will Hurd will be the only Repo Republican. He's been against the wall itself on the record for ever since he first got elected. Right. There are some analysts who say that that was not the issue. Healthcare was the issue. So he, Hel yeah, right. no doubt. he, he yeah. blundered in that respect. Let's go to Alan McPherson. Alan, uh, you're the history professor. Should we be surprised that people are fleeing Central America? I mean, the United States has been deeply involved over decades, perhaps 200 years, in destabilizing much of this part of the world. That's true. Um, you know, the, the same sort of thing happened uh, sort of in slow motion in the 1980s and 1990s when the United States was encouraging wars in most of these countries. Uh, places like El Salvador would send about a, a million people in the 80s and 90s. Uh, many of them ended up in uh, the Los Angeles area. Uh, they ended up in prison system often. Uh, they were radicalized. They joined gangs. Often they or their, their sons went back to El Salvador and created the gangs that are now terrorizing the Salvadorans who are fleeing today. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the gangs because in the 90s, many of the uh, El Salvador, young people from El Salvador who came here initially with their parents, uh, running away from the uh, Civil War, they were sent back to El Salvador by the Clinton administration uh, and took the gangs with them uh, to, to these uh, cities like San Salvador in El Salvador. That's right. Uh, and so they created more of a, a gang system, and so the, the gangs are being reformed in the, in the prisons. Um, the prisons are the place where the gangs in Central America operate from. Um, and, you know, the United States is also responsible uh, for this in another way in that it consumes most of the drugs that are flowing through these, uh, these countries, um, and the gangs are handling those drugs. Oscar, take us through the process on how people get together and decide to leave a country and literally walk across, uh, you know, hundreds of miles to get to the United States. Uh, what is More the process? Of course, people don't just, you know, gather in the city square one morning and decide, okay, let's walk to the United States. How does this work? Well, the first thing that is important to understand is that the numbers of people leaving these three countries together, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, on average is about 700 people per day. So what we are seeing today in terms of this large number of people together taking off and then crossing borders is actually something that nobody could have foreseen because the exodus has been taking place, but it hasn't been taking place in a collective manner. It's been mainly hidden you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, people facing all sorts of difficulties crossing borders, but in an isolated not known manner. So what is new indeed is the fact that people gather together 
And interestingly, when you take into account all the abuses that people face when they cross borders without authorization, the notion that if they travel together, they can actually secure themselves better, they can protect themselves better just by peer numbers or cheer numbers, uh, that is something that is very attractive you know, to a lot of people. Also, it is crucial to understand that most of the people who have been leaving do so often paying some sort of a smuggler to take them through borders, where a lot of people don't have the money that now it's involved in hiring an actual smuggler to take you, and it doesn't guarantee that you will successfully reach the point of destination. So I think it's very important to understand that this is largely a, a spontaneous outburst of energy that we are seeing people gathering together. And I would like to also go back to something that one of the other panelists uh, mentioned. Very recently, meaning the last 10 years, we have had two events in the case of Honduras that have not helped at all create a condition that is welcoming or inviting for people to stay. One was a coup d'etat that was actually supported by the United States government back in 2009 in Honduras. But even more recently, just last November, there was an election very, very questioned by the international community because the guy running for re-election was not even supposed to be running for re-election by constitutional restriction. And not only did the U.S. support that run, but when he won allegedly under fraud, the U.S. ultimately gave its blessing. So these events are also part of what makes people so desperate in trying to band together doing exactly what they've been doing the last four months, the last four weeks, per, excuse me. Mark, uh, President Trump has taken a very hard line on these immigrants. We hear it all the time. He accuses them of wanting to come here to vote, to uh, want to take United States jobs. Uh, but how different uh, is President Trump's approach from previous presidents? Well, first, the rhetoric is obviously more offensive. Right. Um, the rhetoric is, in fact, racist in orientation. Uh, that's one big important change. I noted earlier that the aid continues to flow in that sense. I think that a lot of the programs that we put in place to promote development, to reduce crime in Central America, those uh, continue. I think, regrettably, we're seeing a much lower commitment by the Trump administration to democracy and human rights uh, in the region. We just heard the reference to the election in Honduras. I think the president of Honduras probably stole that election, frankly. Um, in Guatemala, we're seeing an effort by the president of Guatemala to undermine a UN agency which has been fighting uh, corruption. And the administration has basically acquiesced uh, in that effort. Um, I, I would uh, take issue with my fellow panelists with regard to 2009. The Obama administration did not support uh, the coup uh, in Honduras. Um, I think the Obama administration was very supportive of, of democracy and human rights in the region. So we've seen that regression uh, with regard to the, the, to the Trump administration, uh, which I think is most regrettable. And the fact is we don't have perfect partners in the region. And the only way, and, and we can talk about the historical roots of uh, the economic challenges there and the crime and such, but the, the, these countries need to take responsibility now. And they need to be held accountable. The current governments do. And we're still seeing corruptions, corruption at the highest levels of some of these governments. And as a result, I think that's part of the reason that we're not seeing as much progress with the assistance that we'd like to, um, because the money is not being used as effectively. We're not seeing the high quality of governance that we need to see to promote real development. Rafael, President Trump has uh, signed a proclamation saying that he will block certain migrants from seeking asylum here. Um, of course, people seeking asylum in the United States are protected by US law, aren't they? And, and international law, in yeah. fact, uh, the, the whole series of treaties and conventions. Yeah. Uh, the, the legality of, of this proclamation is, of course, in doubt. But the court system takes, takes a while, while, you know, while the Department of Homeland Security will be executing Trump's orders. The most, uh, what advocates consider the most egregious uh, point in this, well, one of many, what they call egregious points in, in, in this proclamation, is not allowing people who've entered the country illegally, so crossed not through a, through a designated port right. of entry, to then apply for asylum. And that's what's ca causing the lines your report from Tijuana. Uh, that, that's, that's creating uh, the, like a bottleneck. And, and the Trump administration is also reassigning a lot of CBP officers from other places. For example, El Paso, the many CBP officers were reassigned, reassigned to Tijuana, mm -hmm. creating a bottleneck for people who cross the border regularly and sort of 
upping the pressure because they have an economic need, a legal, uh, perfectly functional, historical economic need to be crossing. So there, there's a bit of an attempt by the administration to get the rest of the border to sort of get angry at these migrants that are taking these resources. Right. Alan, I want to get back to a little bit of the history of what we're talking about here. The United States has claimed uh, what's been called a right of international police power in Latin America. That goes back quite some time. Uh, it's a power that it exercises in support of United States corporations, as I mentioned, in, in U.S. interests, basically. Um, how has the U.S. used this power, and to what extent has that contributed to some of the violence that we're seeing? Yes, you're referring to the... Uh the Teddy Roosevelt corollary of 1904, uh, when he basically said that the U.S. Marines should try to uh, control the loans that were being made to Latin America so as to keep out European powers and therefore declare an international police power uh, over mostly Central America and the Caribbean and so on, and then used it dozens of times, uh, and so did subsequent um, administrations. In the long term, this created overwhelming U.S. economic and strategic power uh, over the region. Uh, and throughout the 20th century, the United States, I think, primarily wanted to pursue a sort of neoliberal economic policy, encouraging trade, uh, encouraging export-driven trade from Central America and the Caribbean, uh, and therefore creating the sort of inequalities, sort of economic and class inequalities that you see continuing and increasing. So even though neoliberalism can sometimes uh, create wealth, it also creates inequality and therefore creates great poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and the groups that have been excluded for decades, some of them have turned to gangs and violence, and some of them uh, simply want to escape that. Alan, something else, and that is the Central American uh, Free Trade Association, CAFTA, as it's known. Uh, how has that aggravated the situation? Because we know that there are provisions within CAFTA which protect uh, investors' interests. These are American investors' interests, and it actually works against people who are working for these companies in these areas. Right. Well, CAFTA and similar trade deals, I mean, they, they, they create jobs, um, and those can be perfectly fine jobs for some people. Um, they do create some more inequality because a lot of people are kept out of those jobs. Um, and generally, they protect uh, corporations in that those corporations pay uh, few, if you know, no taxes whatsoever to the governments. And so the sorts of problems that we're seeing, the sort of institutional weakness that we've talked about, right, the corruption in the police, the corruption in the courts, uh, it's very difficult to remedy if these local governments have no money. And so if occasional money comes from, let's say, the Obama government, it's not enough to turn around uh, the sort of governability of these countries. Do our governments, can they, uh, if the United States sends aid to these countries, can the United States ask for accountability? How is this money used? Well, a couple of things. First, I, I yeah. think it would be a mistake for us to, you know, suggests that there's some sort of conflict between so-called corporate interests and interests of the people. I mean, one of the things that these countries need is greater foreign investment. And the fact is that you know, companies are not investing there. Both domestic companies and international companies are not investing enough because they don't have the guarantees. And the only way to get true job creation is, is, is through uh, investment by the private sector and the private sector creating you know, well-paid jobs. With regard to the accountability, that in fact is built into the legislation, built into the assistance the United States is providing. So every year the State Department has to certify to Congress that the countries that are receiving aid, El Salvador, Honduras, and, and Guatemala, are uh, taking steps against corruption, number one, and taking steps to reduce irregular migration. Now every year they've been certified. We can debate whether they've, uh, those certifications have been merited, yeah. uh, particularly with regard to corruption. Uh, but there is, in theory, uh, a whole series of, 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 of steps that these countries or boxes they need to check in order to get the assistance. Yeah. Oscar, Mark makes uh, a great point there, that these countries do need investment. But how does one ensure that this investment is for the good of everybody, not just for one, some, one small class of people in these countries? Well, you are touching on essentially the heart of the matter, if you want. I mean, I, I think that there is a lot of wishful thinking in terms of what does foreign investment do. And let me make clear, I mean, in as far as Central America and Mexico, foreign direct investment has been lagging very much behind the revenues that come into these countries by way of remittances. These are the monthly financial contributions sent by nationals of these countries working abroad 
to help their families. And that is far more important than direct foreign investment. But the problem with direct foreign investment is that the jobs that, they, that, they get, that do get generated very often are jobs that fail to provide a minimum standard that allow for food to be put on the table and for, pe for, for people to fulfill their basic economic, social, cultural aspirations. And that is exactly where the problem is. I believe that these caravans that have been taking place lately, in many ways, I, are bringing to the forefront the asymmetry between the freedom that corporations do have to go seek the best possible uh, uh, workplace for them to produce whatever they need to produce, because they, they can produce it at the lowest cost possible. But on the other hand, workers do not, do not have the right to actually go and find the best possible uh, job market for them, knowing precisely that the asymmetry in wages between a place like Honduras and the U.S. is just humongous. And let me also go back to something that I believe one of the fellow panelists said. The U.S. was indeed supportive of the coup d'etat in 2009. And one of the other panelists mentioned the reason why the word coup d'etat was only used once by President Obama and never again. And it is because if a coup d'etat had actually taken place, the U.S. would have been forced to review U.S. foreign aid to Honduras because breaking the democratic order is one of the reasons that would disqualify a given country from receiving whatever aid, even if it is being misused. So again, I think that the question of trade deals and the reality of foreign economic investment in these countries is one that should be indeed reviewed in light of how to make it work in the, in the best interest right. of the common people in these countries if we are to see a stopping migration. Very quick response from you, Mark. Uh, the Obama administration described it as a coup. If we supported it, we wouldn't have called it a coup. <laughs> so. Okay. So, Rafael, let's look ahead uh, to what happens in the United States. Uh, there's been a midterm election here. Democrats now control at least one of the houses in the United States Congress, the House of Representatives. Um, do you see some kind of bipartisan fix coming about that would help people, uh, like the people at the border right now? No, uh, but <laughs> no, but I, I see a lot of attempts at it. Uh, that you, you'll certainly see a lot more engagement in, in the Foreign Affairs Committee in the, in the House, where there are there are members who are interested in in the region. In fact, uh, Representative Norma Torres, for instance, was born in Guatemala. She's she and she's uh, she's on that committee. You'll see on the Senate side, you'll you'll probably see a lot more activity from Marco Rubio on the on the Republican side and Bob Menendez on the Democratic side. They are going to engage on the issue, and the fact is the, the White House is now itself engaging on the issue, although perhaps not in terms that, uh, that Mark would, would, would agree with, uh, having had that, that job previously, but they, they, are, they are certainly focused on preventing Cuban, Cuban, Russian, and Chinese influence in the region are, are the three and sort of, well, the Cuban, Cuban influence is, is the spoken enemy uh, for them, and Chinese and Russian, they're They'll comment on it on background. Okay. Alan, here's something. Uh, a lot of the violence in Central America is drug related, drug gangs um, causing this violence. And um, people like Rex Tillerson, the former Secretary of State, or John Kelly, who's the current uh, Chief of Staff of the White House, have pointed out that, you know, a lot of that drug violence is driven by demand for drugs in the United States. And that's something that the United States can, you know, they can do something about that. Um, is that viable? Can they do something about it? Mm -hmm. Well, of course they can do something about it. I mean, the legalization of marijuana that is ramping up certainly will make some kind of difference. But of course, there's other drugs that the Mexican cartels and the you know the, the drug gangs in Central America they're working with are are you know moving uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, and so this is a very very powerful enemy, much more powerful often than the sort of government forces that are arrayed against them. Uh, but the United States, if it gets into this and really tries to approach it in a sort of non-military uh, manner and not necessarily blaming Latin Americans first, but looking at themselves uh, as the country, the, the main country that is creating the demand for this, uh, they could certainly do something about it. Okay, very quickly. Yeah, this, no, this is an important point. Yeah. I mean, the, mm -hmm. arguably, you can't solve the crime problem in Central America without reducing coca production in Colombia. That's yeah. where the cocaine comes from. Right. The coca production has, has been exploding. And it's not just the U.S. that is a consumer of drugs. We're seeing Latin American countries are now consumers, European countries, yeah. and around the world. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, time's run out. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat.